now I'd like to welcome Ninka Boss, who's from the University of Amsterdam, and she's going to be uh, presenting some research exploring student regulation. Thank you so much. Am I clear? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Ninka Boss from the University of Amsterdam. Um, I did some research together with the Open University uh, of the Netherlands. Um, that's more or less a warning sign already, right, since the keynote this morning. What do you think about this keynote this morning? Was it boo? No, very good. Very good, very good. Because I will elaborate on that a bit. So if you start booing at Paul, you will probably boo at me as well. I'm not very good at handling feedback, so I will probably <laughs> not look at my Twitter stream anymore after this presentation. So let's see. Um, I'm talking about regulation strategies. Paul already said something about that this morning, which is not a learning style. Um, first, I will start off with some background of learning analytics at the University of Amsterdam, which is my university. Um, a couple of years ago, three, four years ago, we felt the need to do something with learning analytics. Um, and mainly it was an IT-driven innovation at that point. Uh, the money for learning analytics went to the IT department. And at that point, I was really skeptical about learning analytics. Um, I didn't see really the point of gathering so much data. Um, we had at, at our university a lack of of implementing learning analytics, a lack of focus. There was no real problem to solve, just the goal in itself was doing learning analytics. So they started building apps, a learning record store, without considering which data should be in the learning record store or what problems should be solved. And my skepticism mainly consisted of this, because what is the predictive value of those data? Everything basically, Paul said this morning as well, how does it impact course performance? Uh, how do we improve the quality of education by gathering this data? Is there a one-size-fits-all? And how to act? Currently, we're still at the point that right, we have all those data and how to act on that data. Because I still think if we just gather data from these clicks, and it was also in the first keynote, that you have this, this, this pigeon, Skinner's pigeon, right? Just pressing some buttons, and if you reward them really well, they will press the same buttons. Um, so that was my main problem, and I wanted to do some research into that. So I was nagging at the university a lot, and they tried to get rid of me by just giving me some money to do my research. So I stopped nagging. Um, I went to the Open University to, for um, so, so some support in that, because uh, they're really good at you know, um, supporting researchers from a side. So um, I want to thank my promoter as well, Saskia, for helping me on doing this. If we look at the current practice of learning analytics, it's still predicting course performance, right? And modeling students' behavior mainly aimed at identifying students at risk. And you have like this, you're not on schedule. I can be on schedule by logging in, pressing some buttons, Ooh, I'm on schedule. Yeah. Did I learn anything? Probably not. So we know a lot about predictors for failure, and we mainly focus on a course level. But this was already um, in the first, mainly the first learning analytics paper by Dawson and McFadden, already written, we cannot do this because we have to evaluate each course on a course level, which is really hard. So what I wanted to do was trying to build on broader assumptions so we can have like some sort of learning analytics model so we, can, we don't have to validate each course over and over again. Currently, in my opinion, Thank that I'm not alone. We have three challenges, I'm not allowed to call them problems. So there are three cha challenges. And mainly, if you read the, um, the paper from Gazevich, Dawson, and Siemens, so who's saying, uh, uh, let's not forget, learning analytics is about learning, it's mainly the same three points they're writing down as well. We have to consider the individual differences in the use of educational technology. I will elaborate on these points further on. We have to establish causes for the dif these differences. If we know why these differences occur, we can subsequently um, act on that. And we should also consider the impact a course design has. Is it online? Is it blended? How much is face-to-face? -face? How much is online? Which kind of different tools you use? So those are the three problems, uh, challenges, I'm sorry, we are currently facing. The first one, oh, the individual differences, um, 
it's already known for a very long time that if you have like a blended learning environment, students use the educational technologies differently. Um, that's the main goal of blended learning, right? We can adapt all the learning resources that will fit, so fit our learning needs. Um, if we look at the literature, we broadly see some distinct patterns. There are, is a group of students who only use one of the learning resources, maybe because they already used it before, so they know how to use it, um, but they don't use the other learning resources. This is either online or in a face-to-face -face environment. doesn't really matter. Then we have, of course, the group of students who do not use the resources at all, the no users, and we have students who use it as a substitute for face-to-face -face activities. Um, mainly these profiles are determined by clustering techniques. So there are some articles who are identifying those user profiles. I've put them right here. Coincidentally, it's one of myself as well. Um, and I just put some of those clustering techniques together and identified some, some um, different kinds of students. I don't know if people have watched The Office, but those uh, characters are based on that. We have the no users, the Angela. Um, she, she doesn't like or she doesn't need anything really. And then we have like the cool guy, Jim, who is an average user of the learning resources. He sometimes shows up for the lectures. He sometimes does some online activities. And then we have like a little bit the nerdy type, the content focused intensive. I'm allowed to say nerdy because I'm a nerd myself. So the content focused intensive uh, users um, who's, who's really fond of the online learning activities. And then he shows an above average use of the learning resources. And lastly, we have Pam, who's mainly, she's a girl, of course, because she mainly likes to interact in a face-to-face -face way. She thinks more, for example, <coughs> that lecture attendance is fun. So if you want to know more about those um, clustering principles and groups, you can find some articles in there as well. We know these exist. We want to know why do they occur. If we know why they, they occur, we can subsequently adjust the learning design. The second challenge we have is regulation of learning. Um, it's considered, a, it's, it's a cognitive load theory, right? About how to approach, you approach learning. And it was already an article written by Buckingham Sham uh, saying we should enhance the learning data with a broader set of indicators so we can really um, have more meaning to the data, go beyond uh, the Skinner pigeon. Um, I try to do it by determining how students regulate the learning process. And there are students who are, who are really good at self-regulating the learning, um, but there are also students who use an external source to regulate their learning. They use, for example, the teacher. These are the students who always are saying in lecture halls, should I know this for the exam? That's external regulation. And then there's a bunch of students who have no clear way of regulating the learning process and they show a lack of regulation. The course design is of course really important. Um, it, it seems like it's, it's, it's an open door or something. You, more use of the LMS is greater predictive value of the LMS. But still, I lead, read a lot of research in which they're still trying to determine the predictive value of the LMS. So we should go beyond that and look at more granular things about the course design, look at that more um, at a distinct level. Of course, there's a big difference between online learning and blended learning. My research is about blended learning because the University of Amsterdam has a lot of face-to-face -face activities that really impacts how uh, the data can speak to you because was a student present at the face-to-face -face activities or weren't they? And have to, do we have to validate each separate course? So those are the challenges we are currently facing within learning analytics, and I, tr I try to solve them. I didn't succeed, though. These are the research questions. This is a really big slide with a lot of text, so we can go through them together. Can we identify different clusters of students based on the regulation strategies? So first, I use the clustering technique. Second, do the difference reflect in the different use of the learning resources? Can we, can we identify combinations of the use of the learning resources that will benefit course performance? And do differences in regulations strategy um, enhance course performance? I will now go into the results. I skipped and I, I dumped all the 
the data out of my presentation. If you want to have all the data, it's in the conference book. I realized there were two um, statistical sessions parallel to this one, so I probably have all the people who are not really fond of data, data. So that's why I chose to do so. The data I collected was first the attendance of the face-to-face -face lecture. I did my research at an introductory, an introductory course of psychology, biological psychology, which is not considered a real easy subject. And there were 333 students, um, about 60% female, 40% male, um, 21 years old more or less. Um, I registered the attendance to the face-to-face -face lecture by scanning their students' cards at the beginning of the lecture. Um, it was a really fun job to do. Um, but at, at least I knew who was in the lecture hall and who wasn't. Those lectures are recorded, just like this one is, and subsequently put online after um, the lecture was finished. We had something called a digital workbook. I translated that literally from Dutch, but you should see it more like as a as an e-learning module. It contains some extra reading materials, some animations, for example, about Pavlov's dog and the drooling, um, with formative assessments in there as well to see if you already understood the material that was presented in the digital workbook. I got the grade from um, um, those assessments and the number of assessments completed. Those were not, students were not forced to do it, but it was encouraged to do so. Then I gathered some LMS data, some hits and duration of use, and I also did a questionnaire about regulation strategies. All students filled out the, uh, the questionnaire because it was already embedded in the curriculum, so I was very lucky about that. And of course, uh, the score and the summative assessment. Then I started clustering based on the regulation strategies. Um, the first cluster has no clear pattern. That's probably the gym, right? Who's just winging it, he's doing something, goes to lecture sometimes, logs into the LMS, but doesn't show a clear, clear pattern. Uh, then we have the second cluster is a combination who has mainly a lack, mainly this person has an external regulation strategy, so it's very reliant on the teacher or the online learning resources uh, for his education. When that fails, then probably you show a lack of regulation. And then we have the third cluster. That's basically what, what we want to teach the students, right? Mainly they're self-regulated a lot, but when they fail to do so, um, they use an external regulation strategy to compensate for that. So we knew that we had three distinct clusters. I was happy I could proceed. Then I started use to see how these different clusters use the different learning resources. And I had to cry a little bit because there were no differences. And that was kind of strange because that was not what I expected because I expected that the students who were externally regulated would be in LMS all the time, would be attending lectures a lot. So when I was done crying, I went on to my third research question. How are those combinations, explained variants, um, are considered within this course, within these different clusters? And then I got really happy, because then I, sh I, sh I really saw some differences. Um, as you can see, I dumped model 4 or 5, which is basically really important, because that contains the LMS data. But that's, that added so little to the model, then I decided to go with model four. So I will go back on that, the low predictive value of the LMS data. As you can see, students in cluster two who have an external regulation strategy, so they would rely on the teacher or the online learning resources a lot, only have 23.2% uh, of explained variance. If you look at the cluster three students, the self-regulated one, you know, the students we wanna have, they show a predictive value of 50.4%. What this means, if I'm a, I'm a self-regulated student, I log on to the LMS and click on some links that will show more, that will add more to my grade than when I'm an ex externally regulated student. So that's strange. There's no significant difference in the use of the learning resources, but when you see how that use contributes to course performance, you see some differences. Uh, what a pity. There was no d significant difference in the final grades of the course. So that's really disappointing, right? Because you would expect that the self-regulated students would do a lot better. Didn't. So 
I started to fiddle with the data a little bit more. This is not in the conference proceeding, so you have a scoop. What I did is the other way around. I just first said, do regulation strategies influence how students learn, use the learning resources? I started clustering the use of the learning resources and subsequently looked at, can I explain differences in regulation strategies? So then you see this. We have the no users, right, who think, I hate everything, don't need anything. She shows a higher self-efficacy at the beginning of the course. She probably overestimates herself. So she decides against attending lectures, against using the LMS. Then we have Jim. He hates lectures. He hardly shows up. Um, he's just winging the course a bit. Um, he has basically no reason to show up. And then we have Dwight, who loves recording of those lectures, but he also shows a, 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 a clear disliking of peer learning. So he's really, he's the online learning student we really like. He's highly self-regulated. But this is the, also the student the lecturers don't like because they don't show up. But he can manage, he will do fine. And then, in the end, we have Pam. She's going, she's loving lectures, but she has an extreme a need for external regulation. So that's basically why she is showing up. She has a low self-efficacy, so she needs the teacher's help. So if we look back at my, my initial research questions, just to summarize, we see three distinct patterns in the way students regulate the learning. They're not reflected in the differences in how they use the learning resources. However, they sh there are differences in explained variants in the end, and there's also uh, the different type of learning resources that have an added value for each cluster. We saw a huge difference between 23% and 50%. Why? The students who are self-regulated, the students we want to have, the students we want to teach, they probably maybe might be suffering from the expertise reversal effect. This course is highly designed to facilitate externally regulated students. You have to show up for lectures, you have to do your digital exercise book, we, we are recording the lectures, so we facilitate everything for these students. The self-regulated students can manage themselves. So by this course design, we are probably holding them back. And that's called the expertise reversal effect. They would have probably done a lot better if the course design was more designed towards their learning needs. But currently, there's only one size fits all. The regulation strategies do not account for the previously reported differences in the use of the digital learning resources, as I showed earlier, right, the four clusters of students. But there are differences in the effects of that use. So if I'm logging on as an externally regulated student, that will not really impact my course performance. If I'm a self-regulated student, that will contribute more to the course performance. There's a lot of people who already wrote about this, so here's some suggestions for some further reading about that. What does this mean for learning analytics? Because basically that's why we're here, right? To see the impact on learning analytics. Uh, the first one um, is contextualizing the data um, is crucial, in my opinion, establishing the impact of the learning analysis because you can really see that students use the different learning resources differently, so we should really elaborate on that. Um, there's a lot of people who already wrote about that. There's a lot of people who already did some research about that. You did as well, right? Together with uh, Dirk Tempelaar as well. They wrote an excellent paper about that too. Um, what we can see here, and that's really the key message, Although all clicks are equal, some clicks are more equal than others. <laughs> <laughs> and that's really important. If I press the link and somebody else presses the link, it doesn't mean the same thing. So we should really, really keep that in mind. Um, as I said, right, I went, I dumped the LMS data in my model. Once again, it is really a low predictive value that the LMS data has. I'm not the first one who is saying this, probably not be the last one who is saying this. I'm surprised still that this happens. Um, my guess is, and I will do some research about that this year, and I will probably be back next year, 
that I think the order in which students use the different learning resources is really important. So we should really focus on temporal analysis on that. Because if I'm doing first an assessment, then watching a video, then reading an article, has probably a different impact on my grade <coughs> than if I'm reading the article first, then doing the formative assessment, and then watching the video. So it must, I really want to focus on that to see if we can enhance the predictive value of the LMS a little bit more. This, this has consequences for the mirroring techniques we're using, right, with all the dashboards. I'm not really a fan of those dashboards because, as I said before, all quick clicks are equal. But what are we mirroring? So if we approach every student at one entity, which they are not, we should really um, should be examining those dashboards more critically. And that's why I liked the talk of uh, Abelardo Pardo this morning so much, because they were going to experiment with those dashboards, putting things on for certain students, putting things off for, for, for other groups of students. And I think that's really the way to approach the whole dashboard uh, thing. Okay. Um, of course, we want to have the loop, right? Because what you currently see as well within learning analytics is that we have like education, we gather data, we analyze, we stop. And we should have completed the whole loop. Um, when I was presenting my research back to the lecturers, at the beginning, they were really pissed off <laughs> because they um, were like, why am I lecturing? Because it, it turns out that lecturing only adds like 80% of 8% to course performance, so they were really wor working really hard, and it turned out it only contributed like minor to final grade. So at the beginning they were you know, a bit upset, let's, call it, let's say it like that. But when they reflected on that, they were really like, let's change our course with the data you collected. So now we are sitting down, and we're really trying to redesign the course, um, and we are trying to go through that next level, right? So we're trying to promote self-regulated learning within that course. What we are focusing on is helping students to make choice, choices because students really think that know, they know how to learn, but basically they don't. So we're really trying to help students to make right choices within choosing the different learning, learning tools they are offered, um, in, in which we are really explaining the added value the tool has to the learning process. I don't mean that we are giving them a manual, should click here or should click there, but we are explaining, for example, if you do the digital workbook, it's not for us. It's not for us on, to check how you are doing or if you are doing it. It's for you to understand if you grasp, grasp certain con concepts or if you should do some additional reading. Students don't really get that because they think I should do it before I enter like the small workbooks. So, so we should really have like, you know, collaboration with students about that. Um, they are skipping a lot of face-to-face -face lectures because they don't want to do that anymore. So we, we are using more and more small snippets of video, you know, the short knowledge clip. And we're using a lot of open courseware for that because this is introduction to biological psychology. There's a lot online, so we shouldn't or we shouldn't redevelop that kind of stuff. And the focus is really on monitoring the process, so not forcing. The current course is a lot of forcing. You should come to the lectures, you should do this, you should do that. They are not allowed to do the final exam if they are not showing up for the small work groups. When I was in university, I only had like two hours of lectures a week, and that was it. I'm still alive, so <laughs> we should probably go back to, to promote self-regulated learning to students a bit more. Um, when I submitted my paper, I got feedback from the reviewers, which was really excellent feedback. Submitted a lot of papers, and most of the time you get depressed by the time you get your feedback back because you totally suck. <laughs> this one was really good. It was really constructive feedback, so I'm thanking the reviewers for that a lot. Um, I just want to, because I know people were going to ask that as well, so I'm probably already answered those questions. I used the ILS for um, determining self-regulation. You think the ILS, it's the inventory learning styles. The learning styles, people, they don't exist. But this was already um, in the course. It was already mandatory. So I got a 100% response rate. In my uh, next research at the law faculty, I used the MSLQ. So if you want to do research like this, 
don't use that Mickey Mouse survey. Use something really validated. Use the MSLQ, for example. I only used those subscales that went um, about regulation strategies. Um, when I did the follow-up research for the law faculty, the survey was not, um, um, they were not forced to, to fill it out, so I only got a 25% response rate. So it's, sometimes you have to choose, right? Um, my LMS data, I only had hits and duration of that use. I have a short answer for that. We have Blackboard. <laughs> that was all I could get out. Um, in the Netherlands, we don't use, or maybe Duva, I don't want to insult other universities, we don't use the whole discussion board a lot. Students probably go to Facebook to do so, so I wasn't able to do anything with that. Um, there were only stu two students who were posting something online, so my social network analysis was done really well. Um, <laughs> the other thing, and that was funny that it was this morning, so I added during the lunch the, a nice article about this, is the self-report discussion, right? They're not really reliable. So that's true. There's also, in my proceedings, there's also a, sub, a short uh, notion of that. Um, but basically, you have to start somewhere, right? As Paul said this morning, we're looking probably at the wrong place because there is the light. And at the other side, we have to, we have to start somewhere just to keep us going. And of course, education is not linear. I did a nice regression analysis, but it doesn't mean if I attend an extra lecture, I will have like five points more in my final exam. So in the next week, because I like to fiddle around with data a lot, I did this. This is not a social network analysis. It is a social network analysis, but of the variables. So that's really nice to see how does different variables <coughs> correlate with each other. So I made one for students who failed the exam and for students who passed the exam. I will present this at a conference in Amsterdam in July, so if you're nearby, you can, uh, can see about that a little bit more. Um, and what I also liked, and I want to go back to the conference a bit more, so I saw this on the first day I arrived. And I fell in love with this because this is what I said, right? You want to have a like, more granular level of the LMS, and you can really see how students are approaching the LMS in this way during the week, and you can also see um, that some are failing because I did an assignment before the final, uh, final assessment. Um, I went to the temporal analysis workshop, so if you really like what you're seeing, because a lot of people are taking pictures, just go to this one, and all the slides are there, all the presentations are there, and if you are at luck next year, you should really go to this workshop, because I think the temporal analysis within learning analytics um, will really hit it off. As I said, I like to fiddle around with my data. So if you want to read more, all my articles are on my LinkedIn profile. They're open, so we don't have to connect. But since I'm a girl, I like to interact. And <laughs> so if you want to connect, you're welcome. So everything is there. Thank you so much. Hi, we've got, we've got a few minutes for questions. Do we have any? Yes, Bill. Thank you for a nice talk. Um, I'd like to invite your comment on a possibly different interpretation about the self-regulating learner. It is that all of the learners are self-regulating, but they're having different standards for monitoring their metacognitive activities and they have different sets of skills. Does that change the way you might conceptualize the results you found? Um, yeah, I, I do, yeah. Um, as you, yeah, students think that they are self-regulated, they're learning. I know your words, thank you. Um, students think that they're self-regulated lear self learners, but in fact they're not. So you're right about that. But it's, it's, for me, it's like a, because I want to say something about regulation of the learning process regarding with the data, but it's also kind of a struggle how to do so. So if you have any suggestions, you're more than welcome to share them with me. <laughs> yes. Maybe it's, it's a dumb question because I'm not they an expert. Exist, right? So my question is, um, don't you think um, focus of self-regulation 
uh, changes according to the topic and the oh, interest yeah. you have for absolutely, the topic? Absolutely, absolutely. So it would that changes even at the task at hand, right? Okay. So yeah, absolutely. So how do you account for that? Or I don't, but you I don't. should have, I know, yeah. No. But then okay. I should, for example, have them question for each different subject they're approaching, for each different task, saying how you're going to approach this task. So yeah. Or uh, pre-assess the, the interest they have for a given topic uh, when they start a... Yeah, that was in the questionnaire as well. Do you really engage in this course? You don't, because sometimes students have to go to a course they while they want to be something else. But even during the course <coughs> that could change because they probably will engage in with materials they thought, oh, this is actually kind of interesting. Okay. So we should have, if you really want to do this in the right way, you should measure at more occasions and even as I said, you know, the regulation changes at the task at hand. Okay. One of your con conclusions, just the last question. Uh, the study confirms the low predictive value LMS use has on course performance. Uh, isn't that more uh, tied to the fact that there is no proper alignment <coughs> between learning objectives, uh, how you measure the attainment uh, and uh, the contents which are provided on the LMS? Could be, could be, as you could see in the, let me see if I can find really quickly, um, what has the biggest predictive value is those formative assessments, right? And they align really well with yes. the final assessment. Okay. So that's true. And basically what you can see within our LMS, there's not so much going on, no interaction, just basically sending a lot of course content to the students. So that's, that's true, because the formative assessment has the best predictive value. Can I, can I ask you oh. just, just oh, two yeah. questions? Number one, how do you measure the length of the click? The length of the click? Yeah, the length of en engagement. <laughs> you said, you know. The duration measure, duration, yeah. yeah. Um, within the LMS? Well, you have, as one of your variables is, say, the length of enga engagement. You know, how do you measure that? Um, for example, for watching the videos, it's, it's rather easy, yes. right, because it's got collected. But you are sure that they will watch it until the end, obviously. No, 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 I just gathered minutes. Sometimes just the students would watch five minutes of that video, others would watch 60 minutes of that video. And this is what you are measuring? Yeah, exactly. I just measured minutes of usage from the different learning resources. And if resources. it is not video? Um, the use of the blackboard that the page was open. And okay. I probably think what your next question is, how do you know if they were actually yeah, yeah, behind yeah, the yeah, computer? They didn't open it and went to the pub and exactly. returned. Exactly. But it accounts the same thing as you go to, for example, to a lecture attendance, because probably you go, you go Facebooking, online shopping. You see it as well yeah, in yeah. the lecture hall. So that's always really tricky because I just, of course, I removed outliers. If they went somewhere else and the computer was open for a couple of days, I removed those results. But that's always the downside of doing this kind of research. You never know if they were really behind a computer. And the next question was, you know, you, this Orwellian question. You know, you don't know what they are clicking on. Can no. you measure what they are clicking on? No, because then I would have to get home with them as well. Um, what, I also <laughs> <laughs> what I also didn't measure, for example, is how much reading they did at home. No, but I mean, click gives you URL, so you know probably what Yeah, I know those, those interactions. And you, you know what the on URL is? Yeah, I do. So, obviously, click are not equal. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's one in the back. Oh, there is. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. It was illuminating. Uh, my question is about other data. You told us that it, um, the average age was 21. Yeah. And uh, teaching in the first year of the university, normally you find those con kind of differences between students depending on how they studied before. So uh, in many papers I see about uh, self-regulatory capacities or processes or whatever, different scientists are calling it, they always state that age and learning experience at the university change the data. Did you feel some, could you observe that as well or those, this clustering process? 
was non-dependent of this kind of data. Yeah, I only did this group of students, the first yeah. year group of students, but it's a very good question you're asking because my concern is that all courses at our university are more or less constructed like this. We don't really learn students how to be self-regulated, how to take responsibility of their own learning process. So it would be better if they would develop those kinds of skills, but I'm afraid they're really not. But it's a really good subsequent research to see in the bachelor degree if they develop that and it will be more one, one kind of students we will find. Okay. Yeah. Last call for questions. Okay, I think we'll finish there and have a cup of tea. Thank you everybody. Thank you for the speakers.